I want to introduce you to <laughs> Dr. Leonard Green, who's going to talk to you about the discounting function. I'm in a certain sort of quandary here because, of course, the longer I talk, the less you will value what he has to say. On the other hand, I can't say nothing. Um, you might even think that if I talk in a short time, I'm saying that this talk is not going to be valuable, and so therefore I'm trying to maximise it. So it's, I, I, I really don't know what to do. Um, Len, um, Len wanted me to say to you um, that the important things that, that he needed to know was that, um, that he never kicked dogs, and he was generally nice to his parents. Um, and that was about it. Um, I think there's, there's a lot more to say. Um, Len uh, uh, finished his BA in, in 1969 and his PhD in 74. And, uh, um, in 75, um, managed to get up sufficient courage to leave New York um, and go to Washington University at St. Louis. Um, he's, uh, he, he's been the author of a vast number of, of research papers, excellent research papers indeed. Um, and uh, the, he's also co-edited um, uh, a book um, and he's, um, he wrote a book on economic choice theory, experimental analysis, animal behavior. Um, he comes with huge qualifications to talk about the discounting function. So because we're running a little late, um, I hope everybody's happy that we should go just a little bit over five o'clock. Um, over to you, Len. Um, just in case I was anxious before, um, this has done it all. And like Bill Timberlake, I would like to thank Bill Pallier, but, like, but unlike Bill Timberlake, I would like to thank Bill Pallier, but uh, given the anxiety I'm going through right now, I'm, I'll wait till after. Uh, he promises me a beer. So the, the full title of the talk is Self-Controlled Choice in the Non-Rational Form of the discounting function. I'll make that clear a little later. The exponential economic form is the rational form. The psychological hyperbolic form is the non-rational, we'll argue. Uh, the, the talk is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is best called id and ego revealed in the pigeon because we're going to deal with self-control and preference reversals. And I'm going to show you id and ego in the pigeon, uh, as well as some other less interesting species. Um, my area of research is on choice behavior, and part of choice involves choices between different amounts, different delays, and an issue that immediately arises is the issue of self-control, which will define for now at least one form of self-control as choices of larger, later, more delayed rewards over a smaller, sooner, more immediate reward, and impulsiveness would be defined oppositely as the choice of the smaller sooner reward over the larger later reward. Um, now, the question is, why would an organism ever choose the smaller sooner reward? It, in one sense, it, some might think that doesn't seem reasonable. After all, more in general, more of something good, a reward, is better than less. So why would an animal choose a smaller reward over a larger reward? Well, one way to conceptualize it, of course, is a, a, a less behavioral way where choosing the smaller sooner reward indicates some failing within the individual, be it uh, a lack of ego strength, uh, poor willpower, poor impulse control, but it's something that's failing within the individual as uh, sort of exemplified by, by Calvin and Hobbes. I don't know which is Calvin and which is Hobbes, uh, but Throwing the snowballs would give me immediate and certain pleasure. Refraining from throwing the snowballs in the hopes of uh, being rewarded at Christmas is delayed and uncertain, so we ponder it, and as usual, goodness hardly puts up a fight. So there's an example of a failing within the individual. Well, the behavioral approach would say when you think about it, what you're dealing with is choice, not necessarily simple choice, more complicated choice. What you're dealing with is you prefer more of a reward to less. So more is preferred to less. However, the more is delayed. And we know that sooner is preferred to later. So you really have a choice in which you have the preferred more 
over the dispreferred less, but it's the dispreferred later over the more preferred now. And it's that sort of concatenation of amount and delay that leads to the self-control problem. Um, so the model we've used to sort of represent um, choices between smaller, sooner, larger, later rewards is this model here. On the y-axis is value. Higher up is greater value. You ha I can't point to this. You won't see. Um, the, the vertical bars represent the value of two rewards. The lower vertical bar is the smaller reward. The larger vertical bar is the larger reward. And we have time from the reward. So for example, at t sub 1, you're far away from the rewards. And as you get closer and closer in time, you move to t sub 2. Now notice you're close to the smaller reward. And the green and red curves represent the discounting of value. Um, obviously, the further reward is from you, the less its present value. Now notice what this model says is when you're at t sub 2, when you're close to the smaller sooner reward, it has a greater value represented by the, the red part of the curve at that point is greater than the green part of the curve. So at that point in time, you would choose the smaller sooner reward. However, if you're further away from those rewards at t sub 1, notice according to this representation, the preferences reverse. And now green is above red, so now you would choose uh, the larger, more delayed reward over the sooner, uh, smaller reward. Now, the question then is, I mean, obviously this works because I've drawn it. The question is, will it work in real species? So does preference reverse when you move from the smaller sooner to the larger later reward? Um, well, there's anecdotal evidence, as evidenced by my agreeing to do this talk. Um, at t sub 1, whereas if I were asked last night, there's no way in hell. Uh, and it's also evidenced by cartoons, so therefore it must be true. Uh, not unrelated to the talk. Uh, thinking in advance about giving the talk, uh, you think about your reputation, or you should do it for science, or however Bill pleads ever so well. Uh, but just before the talk, uh, preferences have certainly reversed. So let's look at it in uh, rat first. There's your rat. You're all familiar with the basic Skinner box. In this case, there are two levers. Pressing one lever will give a small reward sooner. Pressing the other lever will give the larger reward a little later. And what we're going to do in this experiment is just vary the time before the sooner reward can, be, can occur. So if you press the, the lever, you can get the sooner reward in, say, a second. If you press the right-hand lever, you get the larger reward in 10 seconds. Then we'll add a constant delay to both. So we'll say, OK, if you press the left lever, you'll get the smaller reward in 12 seconds. So we'll add 11 seconds to it. And if you press the right-hand lever, you'll get it in 22 seconds. So you're just adding a constant delay before it. And we did this experiment with rats. Uh, because there really hadn't been good preference reversals shown in rats. And we did it where the rewards under one condition were food pellets. So two pellets of food versus four pellets of food is the large reward. And then we also did it with water. Uh, for example, one dipper of water versus three dippers of water. And these are the data from the six rats. Um, the first, rats one, three, and six ran under the food ex phase first, and then they went to the water. And the other rats ran on the water phase first, went to the food. The simple thing to notice, on the y-axis, we have percent choice of the larger later reward. And along the x is the delay before the sooner. Now notice, when they're close in time to the sooner, the delay is only half a second or one second. All the rats under both the food and the water are choosing the smaller sooner lever. However, as you add a constant delay before the outcomes, all the rats that went out, I'll talk louder. All the rats increase their choice for the larger later reward. Uh, so you see these preference reversals in individual rats. Well, we also did it with humans. 
And in this case, don't worry about all the data here. Don't worry about what the different conditions, the different curves represent. What I want you to get here is the humans were offered a choice between a small amount of money soon or a larger amount later. And we used it for three different pairs of amounts, 20 versus $50, 100 versus 250, or 500 versus 1250. And we had lots of different variations. The thing I want you to get from this is when they had the choice between those two amounts and they can get the smaller amount very soon in time or the larger amount later, as you then added a constant delay before they can get them, notice in all the cases you see upward moving functions. Uh, and in fact, you find preference reversals. So they switch from the smaller sooner to the larger later. So we have it in rat, we have it in human. However, I realize this is squab, or at least squab, um, what's the word? Tutor. Squab what? Tutor. Inspired. Um, and so the question you're asking, of course, is, ah, it's true in rats and humans, but critically important, is it true in pigeon? Uh, after all, uh, man wasn't meant to live on his own, so we can get you some pigeons cheap. Uh, and so we did the following experiment with pigeon. Oh, there's a pigeon. Um, and I put that in for a few people. Ye a few years ago, at a Behavioral Follies, they showed pictures of people from years before and presently. You will notice that only Billy Baum did not change over a 10, 15, 20 <laughs> years. Um, others have. Uh, here's the experiment. There's a 30-second period during which there's a house light. At the end of the 30-second period, the pigeon either can get two seconds of food or there's a four second delay and then it gets six seconds of food. So it's a choice between a smaller sooner or a larger later. And what we did is we varied within the 30 second period when the pigeon could choose between the smaller sooner or the larger later. So there'd be a red and green key close in time to the outcome, say two seconds before the end of the 30 second period, and it could choose between the red or green. Another condition, it might be five, 10 seconds. Another condition would be 28 seconds from the end of the trial. The prediction is the further away it is, the more they should choose, the more they should show ego strength, the closer in time, the more they should be controlled by id. And here are the data from four individual pigeons, and you see beautiful preference reversals. When they're close in time to the end of the trial, they all overwhelmingly are id-controlled, choosing the smaller sooner reward. As they move further away in time, they all change their preference and switch over to the larger later reward, consistent with that model. Okay? So the argument here is these reversals and preferences are consistent with the thinking of this type of choice. Uh, in behavioral terms, not as something within you necessarily, though I don't want to deny that doesn't exist, um, but I want you to think of self-control as in addition to however else you think of it, as something one does, not only, or if at all, as something one has. Uh, and I also want to argue it's not a case of self-deception, it's not a case of lying, it's not a case of a failing inside the individual. Rather, it's a question of dealing with amount and delays to reward. Um, we've all experienced it. In the morning, you think you're going to study, but when the evening comes, now you don't study. Uh, yes, you're going to prepare a talk uh, later that day, and then later that day, you sort of find other reasons for doing other things than preparing the talk. Um, so. That's support for the model. But now we'll switch to the second part of the talk, and that's on discounting. And here, the important question is, I've shown you those red and green curves. I've shown you the model. But now, on the form of the discounting function, we want to know what is, might there be a general form to that discounting function? And so we're going to have a series of questions to try to get at, to try to answer what that form might be. Uh, so we're going to run through these questions, and this is why PowerPoint is good. I don't have to keep switching overheads. Several questions, and 
I'll run through them quickly because we'll answer them. What's the mathematical form of the discounting function? And I'll have to explain to you why I think it matters. Then does the form and or the rate of discounting change across the lifespan? Uh, how does amount of reward influence temporal discounting, temporal meaning delay? Uh, how does, and would the same form of mathematical discounting function that accounts for delay discounting, temporal discounting, would it also account for probabilistic discounting, when rewards are probabilistic in nature instead of delayed? Uh, then what about amount of reward? How does that influence the discounting of probabilistic rewards? And then to look at the generality, are there differences in the form of either the temporal or discounting function across individuals from different cultures? Are there differences in the form or the rate of discounting in special populations? I'll tell you what those are as we go along. And then finally, what are these results on discounting? What might they suggest about underlying decision-making processes? So what is the mathematical form of the function? Well, the, the economic model is the standard exponential discounting function. V is the present value. A, of course, is the amount. D is the delay. And K is the discount rate parameter. The higher the K, the faster you discount. The lower the K, the more shallow, the less steep the discounting. You have the standard economic model, the exponential model, and you have the non-rational, I hope to tell you why it's non-rational, uh, hyperbolic model of Jim Mazur that, uh, that, that V is the amount uh, inversely related to delay and also a more general form of the hyperbolic discounting model, a hyperbola-like model. Notice all we've done there is added an exponent. Um, of course, if the exponent equals 1, then it reduces to the simple hyperbola. So it's not a, a different equation. It's a more general equation. I'd like to argue it's sort of like the generalized matching law is, is a more general form of the regular matching law, and it reduces to the the, the matching law. The same thing here. So let me show you what a hyperbolic function would look like versus an exponential function. The red line here is the hyperbolic. The green is the exponential. They are different forms. Um, and now the question is, well, they look pretty similar. What's the difference? Notice for now, because we're going to show you data, the hyperbolic function decreases more steeply with brief delays than does the exponential. And then it, it, it tapers off uh, more gradually. So the exponential is more steep at longer delays than is the hyperbola. So that it, it is a different, I mean, we'll make different predictions when we look at actual data. Now the question is, it's, it's been important in behavioral ecology, in economics, and in psychology to figure out what is the form of that discount function. And it's important. Um, the economists think the exponential is rational, uh, where the, the, the psychologists have used the hyperbola. In economics, one of, the re one of the nice things about the exponential is the way it deals with risk. It assesses risk that every increment in time adds a constant unit of risk. That's a very rational thing. It's a very normal thing. Each additional unit of time adds a constant amount of risk. The hyperbola thinks of risk differently. It says that each additional unit of time adds a decreasing amount of risk. So it represents risk very differently. And that will have different implications for models of foraging, for preference reversals, for um, um, self-control issues. So it really does make a difference to, uh, to find out which is true, I would argue. Um, this is the procedure we use with humans. Um, well, it's not quite. We've used several different procedures. But basically, we use hypothetical amounts of money. And we say, OK, you can have, say, $1,000 in six months. How much would you take right now that's equivalent to it? I mean, if I were to say to you, you can have $1,000 in six months, or you can have $1,000 right now, well, you'll choose $1,000 right now. So we'll lower it and we'll say, OK, what about 900 right now, as opposed to waiting six months for 1,000? 
Well, you might say, well, I don't want to wait a month, I'll take the 900 now. But if I say, all right, what about 800 now? Well, you might say, no, I'm willing to wait a month to get the 1,000. So we have, at some point, an indifference point in which a certain amount of money now is equivalent to the larger amount later. So in this case, we do it $1,000 in six months to get your, your present value. And then we might do $1,000 in a year, $1,000 in 10 years, $1,000 in a week. And we get all these points, and then we can fit a discount function to it. We'll also do it with different amounts, as you'll see later, to see if that tells us anything interesting. So that's the basic procedure. And to show you the data, the, the, the solid and open circles, the solid circles are when the delayed amount is $1,000. The open circles when the delayed amount is $10,000. Uh, the circles represent the equivalence points, how much right now is equal to waiting to get the larger amount. Uh, the red line there is the hyperbola, and the green line is the exponential. You'll notice the hyperbola does a better job of fitting the data than does the exponential. But now let me show you the, the fuller model, the hyperbola-like. You will see, see with the 10,000, well, let me try this. Notice what the exponential does. This is important, because I'm going to show you, R, I'm going to tell you R squared values that, of course, the hyperbola-like is a much better fit when you look at amount of variance accounted for. But that's not so important as the exponential systematically errors. It's not just that the hyperbola fits better. There's systematic error with the exponential. Notice, it's a little hard to see here. You can see it very much with the 10,000. The exponential over predicts at, early, at brief delays and under predicts at longer delays. Now, if you look at the hyperbola-like, this is just for the 10,000 now. The, the uh, dashed lines are the same exponential and hyperbola as before. And now the solid line is that hyperbola-like, the one that adds the exponent. And notice it does not have that same systematic error that the other forms of equations have. And I, I need to emphasize how important that is. It's not just that the hyperbola-like accounts for more of the variance. It has an extra free parameter. Of course, it accounts for more of the variance. The point is it does away with the systematic error. And so you really have to look at your data and see that's what's going on. So what's the mathematical form of the temporal discounting function? The argument is it's hyperbola-like. And of course, if the exponent is 1, then it reduces to the simple hyperbola. OK, so we now know the form of that. The next, does the form of the discounting function change across the lifespan? This is an important issue. You might expect, of course, that children might not show lovely discounting. I mean, imagine children, if you will, nothing original here. There's someone named Piaget. So they go through qualitative differences, qualitative changes. If that's true, then you might think that the children will not show a lovely hyperbola-like discounting function. Their decision-making is fundamentally different from adults. On the other hand, you might think that older adults will show lovely discounting, like young adults. But they might not have a, a neat function. It might work initially, but then you might get a dichotomous function. It'll show nice discounting, but as the delays go far out, 10 year, what, how, much, how much would you take now as opposed to $1,000 in 10 years or 20 years? You might think that if they're older adults, you know, 20 years from now is risking it. So they might show lovely discounting up to a point, and then it sort of crashes. So it's, it's, it's not immediately obvious that young kids, young adults, and older adults will show the same form of discounting. Um, and so we did the experiment to find out. These are 12-year-old children, college undergraduates, and 68-year, on average, 68-year-old adults. And the, uh, 
it was a thousand dollar hypothetical reward, and we ran through that, that temporal discounting procedure. And what you should notice here is that the same form of mathematical function, that hyperbola-like function, fit beautifully the data of older adults, younger adults, and 12-year-old children. So the answer is that yes, uh, the same form of discounting function can account for discounting across the lifespan. Now, what about rate of discounting? Well, at this point, that becomes a no-brainer. You would expect that the young children should discount very steeply, and you might suggest that the older adults, they've had greater experience, uh, more, more life experiences, more abilities to learn to delay, so they will show less steep discounting. Uh, let me just show you the data again. If you look at the initial decrease, notice the children are discounting very steeply. The younger adults, it's, it's more shallow, and the older adults are even shallower still. Um, also want to show you that this function works at the individual level. So here are four children. Uh, again, the circles are the actual data. The curve is the hyperbola-like hyperbola -like model. And notice how well it fits at the individual level on these four. This is for the individual young adults. It fits rather well. And this is for the individual older adults. Less steep, but it still accounts for it very well. So the same quantitative rule works on both. There doesn't seem to be qualitative changes. There are quantitative differences, different parameter values, different K values for the young adults, the older adults, and the children, but it's the same form of discounting function. So the rate does change. It decreases with age, as you might suspect now. Um, Importantly, the next question was, how does amount of reward influence rate of discounting? And here's where it becomes important, uh, or again, where it becomes important, comparing the hyperbola with the, the rational form from economics. The standard economic discounting function argues that rate of discounting is amount invariant. Uh, $1,000 is discounted at a certain rate. It doesn't matter if it's 10,000, a million, a hundred. They are discounted at the same rate. Uh, so we ran the study using different amounts. And sure enough, what you find is that larger amounts are discounted less steeply. Percentage lost with time is less with larger amounts. So the discounting of $100 is rather steep. The discounting of 2,000 is less steep, 25,000 even less steep. You can see that with the K values, uh, the Ks decrease with amount. It does level off there in case you're noticing. So the value of a large future reward is discounted less steeply than the value of a small future reward. Please remember that larger rewards, larger delayed rewards are discounted less steeply than smaller delayed rewards. And you might be sitting there saying that's reasonable, or you might even be saying that's obvious. Good. Just keep that in mind, because we're going to come back to that. OK. This is going to be a general form of discounting. Then it would be nice to know what if you're using probabilistic rewards. These were all delayed rewards. Now, what about if it's probabilistic? Would the same mathematical function that describes the discounting of delayed rewards also account for the discounting of probabilistic rewards? Well, we have the same mathematical equation. So I have the temporal discounting function on top, amount, k is the discounting rate parameter, d is the delay, s is the exponent, s think of as a scaling component, nonlinear scaling of amount or delay. And notice the probability discounting function is identical, except there the discounting rate we'll call h, because you can't call it the same letter. Um, and we have enough letters in the alphabet to figure this out. Uh, and theta is odds against. So the higher the probability, uh, the, the higher the probable re re reward, the lower the odds against. You're very likely to get it. The, the, the lower the probability, the greater the odds against getting it. So we can plot this on, e on reasonably similar scales. And again, we use a very simple procedure, the same as before. 
Except now, instead of saying, how much would you take right now that's equivalent to, say, $1,000 in a year, now we would say something like, how much would you take for sure as opposed to $1,000 with a 60% chance of occurrence? Okay? Otherwise, same procedure. And here are the data with uh, a reward of $500, hypothetical amount of $500. The top figure is with delay discounting. So it's $500 at different delays. Notice the nice hyperbola function fits it. And the bottom is the odds against. Now this is the probabilistic rewards. And again, we fit there the exponential, the hyperbola, and the more general hyperbola-like. And we have a detail because all the action is at the beginning. And so we've blown it up. And you can see, once again, the exponential systematically errs in its predictions. And the hyperbola-like gets it. It does, the, the exponential over-predicts and then under-predicts. And the hyperbola-like better fits the form there, not only amount of variance accounted for. So the answer is the same mathematical function that accounts for delay discounting can account for probability discounting. So then the important question is, what about rate um, as a function of amount? Remember, with delay discounting, the larger amounts are discounted less steeply than the smaller amounts. If, as some theories argue, that delay and probability are in effect identical because, as one theory says, probability can be converted to delay. Therefore, delay is fundamental. Another theory says probability is fundamental. Risk is what matters, because with increasing delay, there's greater risk. And so you can convert delay to probability. Both of these theories say that delay and probability are the same, because you can convert one to the other. Well, it turns out that amount of reward influences rate of discounting probabilistic events in a direction opposite from the way amount of reward influences the discounting of delayed rewards. So notice on top, you have the discounting of a delayed reward, a small reward of $500 in red, and a larger delayed reward, the, triang the, the bluish greenish triangular symbols, uh, is the large reward. Notice the rate of discounting the smaller delayed reward is steeper, is greater. However, notice for the probabilistic reward, the smaller reward is discounted less steeply. The larger amount is discounted, the larger probabilistic reward is discounted more steeply. Uh, here are four individuals. Uh, this was the best fit, 75th, 50th, 25th percentile subjects. Notice on the left, the left panels, we have delay discounting. Notice the smaller reward is discounted more steeply than the larger reward. And notice with probability, there's either no difference or the smaller reward is discounted less steeply than the larger probabilistic amount. Uh, and if you plot the K values or the H values, it shows up beautifully. Notice, as amount of reward increases, the rate of discounting the delayed reward, the k parameter, decreases and begins to level off. Whereas, with probabilistic rewards, as the amount of the probabilistic reward increases, the rate of discounting, represented by the h parameter, increases. So, how does amount affect it? Well, you have, with delayed rewards, the amount effect and with probabilistic rewards, what we'll call the reverse amount effect. So now, what about the form of the discounting functions across cultures? Is, this, is it similar across different cultures? So we did a study with um, using um, 
graduate students from Japan versus graduate students from the United States versus graduate students from China. We ran them on delay discounting and probability discounting. There are the results, the Americans, Chinese, Japanese. Notice, I was going to say two things, but I don't know, as I talk, there might be three. Uh, notice, first of all, the hyperbola-like equation accounts for the data beautifully across all three cultural groups. So the same mathematical function works for both delay and probability discounting. Also notice you have the amount effect in all three groups for delay, and you have the reverse amount effect, or no difference, in all three groups for the probability discounting. So the same form of temporal discounting and probability discounting function works for individuals across cultures. Well, how does form and rate differ across different populations, uh, different special populations. Well, I've taken data from uh, different experiments here, and I can mention others. Uh, this is data on the discounting of a $1,000 delayed reward and a $10,000 delayed reward as a function of income. We have 30-year-olds who are wealthy, reasonably wealthy. We have 70-year-olds who are reasonably wealthy and 70-year-olds who are poor. And we did the delay discounting across these three groups. And as you find here, the poorer individuals, the poorer elderly, discount the delayed reward much more significantly, more steeply than do the wealthy older adults. So you have income effects here um, that, that, that show up. Um, Dan Holt has, has done some work with gamblers versus non-gamblers on delay discounting and on probability discounting. And two things to notice here, with both gamblers and non-gamblers, the same mathematical discounting function accounts for their data. However, their difference is in between the, the gamblers and the non-gamblers in their rate of discounting probabilistic rewards. When you think about gambling, you're dealing with risky alternatives. And indeed, you find the differences in rate of discounting probabilistic rewards between gamblers and non-gamblers. Interestingly, he didn't find a difference in rate of discounting between the two groups with delayed rewards. Uh, if that holds up, I think that's theoretically fascinating. Uh, here's some work. Um, from Madden and his group on um, opiate-dependent uh, individuals, uh, discounting heroin and discounting money uh, compared with a control non-opioid-dependent uh, individuals. What you notice here in the upper panel is that the opioid-dependent individuals discount money at a much steeper rate than do controls. So we have special populations the same mathematical equation, again, accounts for the discounting, but differences in rate of discounting. And very interesting, if you look on the bottom panel, the opioid-dependent individuals discounted, offered certain uh, bags of heroin. Later, you can have a certain number right now, and they did it with money. And interestingly, the, the opioid-dependent individuals discounted the heroin more steeply than they discounted money. Um, I, 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 you could make a nice story that that sort of makes sense, and it's just lovely data there. But again, the same mathematical function accounts for all that, or describes all that. So there appear to be differences in the rate of discounting across different special populations, but the same form. Uh, okay. What do the, I could slow down now. What do these results suggest about the underlying decision-making processes? Well, the thing is, I, I, what strikes us is the remarkable consistency. You have this reasonably simple discount function that accounts for the discounting of delayed rewards. It accounts for the discounting of probabilistic rewards. It accounts for the discounting in special populations. It accounts for the discounting across different cultural groups. 
it accounts for the discounting or describes the discounting across the lifespan. That is consistent with the view that maybe there's some general decision-making process underlying all of this. Uh, I can't read what that says here. So you, if you can, great. If not, doesn't matter. Uh, uh, also, we wanted to know, would the same mathematical form describe the discounting of delayed rewards in rats and, most importantly, in pigeon? And so we're running experiments now uh, using the maser type procedure where the rats and the pigeons can, can press or peck at one alternative, which gives them a delay followed by a certain number of pellets. If they press or peck the other alternative, they can get fewer pellets and they can adjust that. So they can adjust how much they want right now as opposed to a larger amount in, say, two seconds until we get an equivalence point, then we do it at eight seconds, then we do it at 32 seconds, then we do it at one second. So we can plot out a discounting function for the rats and pigeons and then fit the exponential and the hyperbola alike, but there's no reason to fit the exponential um, anymore, obviously. Here's the data from two rats. Uh, the delayed reward was 12 pellets at 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32 seconds. How, much would, how many pellets would they take right now as opposed to waiting for the 12 pellets? The circles, of course, or the triangles and the triangles, are the actual indifference points, the amounts they would take now. And notice that hyperbola-like equation does a reasonably good job of accounting for the data. The R squares are above 0.9. Uh, and in pigeon, Again, the R squared for one is 0.94. For the other one, it's, it's only 0.86. Uh, also, interestingly, and I guess not surprisingly, the rate of discounting in the pigeon is greater than that in the rat. I mean, pigeons have no self-control. I mean, they are about pure id. Uh, I mean, even the rat uh, is better. Um, so, such a pattern of results is consistent with the view that not identical, but certainly similar processes are underlying the discounting of both delayed and probabilistic rewards. Um, now, we began by talking about self-control and preference reversals, and I argued that self-control is something you do, not something you have. And I, I want to end by suggesting that the term self-control is a problem because it involves an evaluative component. Self-control is good. Impulsiveness is bad. And I, I don't want to argue that that's totally wrong. But what I do want to argue is there are many times, and it's evolutionarily adaptive at times, to be impulsive. After all, with delay, there is risk. A competitor can get to your food. Uh, you can die before you get it. Uh, if you wait too, you know, if you keep waiting to get a large reward, you may never make it there. So there's reason, there's evolutionary reasons to be impulsive. So I don't want to argue for the evaluation of self-control. And as Ed Fantino said, uh, the future is uncertain. Sometimes you should eat dessert first. But there's also a second aspect I want you to keep in mind. And that is, given that this is a choice model, that the context is going to determine when you should choose the smaller sooner reward and when you might go for the larger later reward. And it's how you view the context that might determine what's appropriate. And so we have a beggar walking up to a well-dressed woman on Rodeo Drive who says, I haven't eaten anything in four days. And she says, God, I wish I had your willpower. So the context is everything. Thank you.
repeatedly and think of it as a memory problem. But in the human studies, clearly that's not as true. At least it's not in a simple way. Does that mean that we're incorrect in thinking in the animal studies that it is a memory issue? I mean, they Oh, what, 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 what Ben's saying is with, with animal studies, non-human animal studies, we're assuming that with delay there's memory failures going on, memory loss, uh, interference, confusion, that it's a memory issue that might be accounting for it. Whereas with humans, we certainly don't assume it's a memory issue. Um, and would I comment on that? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, first of all, I don't want to argue there are no memory problems with the animals. However, I don't think memory problems account for this. Because indeed, when you run controls, say, uh, you, for example, you might argue that when it's a delayed reward, 32 seconds, the animal can't remember. So of course his choice is going to move, say, towards indifference. If I don't remember which is the larger, which is the smaller, they would move towards indifference. One is they don't move to indifference. They completely switch over. Secondly, when you run controls in which you use the same delay, say a 32-second delay, and pecking the red gives you the smaller reward at the end of 32 seconds, and pecking the green gives you the larger reward at the end of 32 seconds, they have no problem. They overwhelmingly choose the larger reward. And I can show you, the, the, in fact, those data were in the rat study, but I didn't point it out. So those control conditions show it's not just... Well, not necessarily. I mean, you may have better memory of a... Well, I guess you're right. I, I would agree with that. Can I follow up on that? Have there been been comparison of the uh, if I gave you how long would you wait verbal human studies with human studies in which there are real delays and real analysis and we get uh, how it's stated? Okay, a, a couple of things. One is, in fact, Dan's going to be looking at that, Dan Holt is going to be looking at that specifically. Instead of varying the amount at a constant delay, then you get that amount and now vary the delay and see if they map on to each other. Um, I think the second part of your question is, one, if you use, if you use real amounts and, um, and real delays, uh, there are published data in which real amounts of money were used with humans. Now, in general, they were reasonably small amounts. I mean, they weren't $10,000 or 25000 But when they used small amounts, reasonably small amounts, uh, Chris Kirby's work, in which you find the hyperbola fits it and fits it better than the exponential. No, they're real delays. Uh, the way it's, 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 sem it's pseudo real. Um, what it is is one of your choices will be selected. So you better choose appropriately because then if on that one we select, you chose the delayed reward then at that delay, you get your check. On the other hand, if you took the smaller reward, then right now you get that. And they do get that payoff at the appropriate delay. And the same function fits. One more question. The very short delays that the pensions can tolerate possibly reflects their ecological niche. They tend to feed the flocks. And watching pigeons, if it doesn't pick up the bloody peanut in the next second, some other pigeon will. Whereas the nature of rats being is much more distributed, and there is not the need to immediately consume food. It would be interesting to look at this with respect to other families of reinforcers. The uh, impulsive choice for humans, which you were so deep associating with ego and pointed out at the end of your lecture, may not be in fact, deleterious in many situations. If you think about the evolutionary roots of this, our, our world 100,000 years ago was much less stable. What modern civilization has given us is greater certainty about outcomes. And 
I mean, quite possibly, if not caught up with it for wax or pigeons, there's nothing necessarily deleterious at all about what we're calling impulsive behavior. For us, there often, not always is. Right, but th there's an interesting corollary to that. Uh, major thrust of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> given, in, in effect, and then yell at me if I'm changing it too drastically. Evolutionary pressures are such that impulsivity in one species might be selected for. And depending upon the evolutionary pressures, you will see more or less impulsivity. I, I, I think that's a fair way of representing. Uh, and, and the answer to that is yes, that's true, in which case under situations that you can try to make as reasonably identical as possible, you will see differences across species depending upon the evolutionary niche in which they were adapted. What's nice about that is you can make predictions depending upon their evolutionary pressures. However, what still is remarkable is given those differences in evolutionary pressures, which help inform, still the same description applies across species, across evolutionary pressures. So there still is something fundamentally similar. I think the one question that I haven't had answered to you today is the question about when I go into a shop and I buy a really nice bottle of red wine, and the man in the shop says, well, you want to keep this for three or four years, you know, it'd be really good. Then, you know, um, but if you keep it, you know, six years, it's going to be terrible. What do I do? I get it home and drink it. Right away. <laughs> the answer to that is you buy many bottles. That's an investment problem. Well, um, thank you, Lynn. That was a superb talk. Um, it's fast. And fast.